is Carlton, one of Melbourne's most cosmopolitan suburbs. Carlton is near the city, near the airport, near the university, so a lot of students live here. The terrace houses are graceful and well preserved, and surrounding them are some of the reasons why Carlton has drawn young people from other parts of the state. There are small art galleries, there are intimate theatres, shops filled with colourful clothing, and of course the new love -in. The latest... Those involved will either, have either died, will spend the rest of their lives in jail, or have had to flee. This is Cosmopolitan Carlton. Well, there's nothing evil about Ligon Street. It simply is the fact that way back in Victoria's history in 1963-64, there was a series of murders known as the Market Murders, which was a bit of a power play in what was known as the Honoured Society, which was a uh, Calabrian-based organised crime group. Ligon Street had these upstairs rooms where they would uh, run uh, like uh, gaming rooms as part of uh, the way to subsidise subsidize the restaurant downstairs. It meant the food was always magnificent quality because they could subsidise the food through the gambling upstairs. Now that, with the arrival of Cranker Centre, that almost dried up overnight and that made a real difference to the way that these restaurants now uh, now run. Even into the 80s, uh, it was an area where there was a lot of illegal gambling. So it became a place where a number of criminals would frequent and uh, build their associations, develop criminal conspiracies. There was a lot of money coming out of illegal gambling in those days. That of course now is almost finished because of Crown Casino. Police would tell you stories that during the illegal two-up school, if the police raided it and Gatto was there, if uh, some of the people there started to arc up and complain or looked as though they were going to go violent, it was Gatto, not the police who turned around and said, oh, hang on, these blokes have got a job to do, just let them do their job. McGatto, the most scary thing you can ever see is a gangster in, uh, in a t-shirt and shorts and that's how we used to see him. He's seen as colourful. Uh, he's seen at times as being funny. It's known that he donates to charities. But if he's a gangster and breaks the law, well, he should be investigated. Each person is, is unique, and, and he is uh, uh, he's liked by a lot of people, uh, unlike a lot of others. Uh, and I wouldn't slot him into the gangland mould in that sort of way at all. The trial was, was portrayed as a, a sort of a gangland killing uh, and it really wasn't. It was a very limited kind of uh, trial in terms of the issues that it raised. Uh, we had a situation where, uh, unlike any of the other gangland killings, uh, uh, Mr Gatto had shot Mr Veniamin that was never to be in dispute. It wasn't a who done it or a, anything like that. As you know, in a lot of the other killings, a, a Piranha Task Force and others have been investigating to find out who did what. Uh, that was never the issue in this trial. The sole issue in this trial really was whether or not the shooting was in self-defence. Well, it was huge news. It was interesting because uh, uh, the jury would have known all about Gatto's background. They would have known that he was seen as a, quote, gangland figure. So there must have been pressure upon them to see, oh, well, this was, could have been murder. But they obviously judged it on what was put before them. And of course, there was two people present when Andrew Veneman was shot, and uh, one said it was self-defence and the other was dead. Sylvester and Ian Munro, uh, but in particular John Sylvester, I think, uh, did sensationalise it in a way that uh, uh, I thought was uh, not terribly fair to Gatto. And that's the issue that the media has to consistently be careful of. Because if you start uh, speculating on who's on whose side or you know, who's going to be in the team this week, 
the gangsters read it. And all of a sudden people can get killed, not for what they have done, but what they might do. It was quite an amazing event because the Supreme Court, I don't care who you are, it's a very intimidating building and to be charged with, a, with murder, it would be terrifying. The usual stresses and strains of trial manifested themselves, but I have to tell you, he was, a, he was a, an excellent client who took advice and did what uh, he had to do. He maintained uh, 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 dignity and he maintained composure. As the jury was about to come back, he stood and chatted with his family and he showed enormous composure, chatting with his wife, his son and his daughter and he seemed more concerned about their welfare than his. And when the jury came back and finally acquitted, he just lifted his glasses up like that, rubbed his eyes very quickly and then turned to his adoring crowd. He showed remarkable composure when you think that uh, in his late 40s, he would have been looking at 15 or 16 years minimum if he'd been convicted, best years of his life. There's always that sort of uh, by play when you're dealing with these guys, is that you have, a, you have an idea about what sort of stuff they're up to, and that sort of, and it can be, while any way to work yourself loves them because they're going to give you a decent tip, at the same time, there's this recognition of just what sort of violence they represent. Historically, whenever there's a lot of money up for grabs, people will be fighting over it and uh, that's the way so-called gangland wars develop. First off, it's life and death, and secondly, many of these people are really charismatic characters. They uh, live with a recklessness that you sometimes can admire. They push the boundaries upon which you would not. They are prepared to risk their lives and so on. But it's a shocking way to live. When the dust settles, the acts of very, very stupid men.